and for today. So if you've got your Bible as we're setting this up, I want to encourage you to open up. If you have your app, open your Bible app on your phone or your tablet to the book of Joshua. It should be the sixth book in your Bible, the sixth different title, the sixth different heading. So if you start Genesis, uh, just jump over, over five more and hit Joshua. If you see anything uh, like a king or a chronicle or a psalm or the name of someone other than Joshua, you went too far. You need to take a left. So we're in, we're in the Old Testament still in our chronological study. We're walking through a three-year walk through the, the, the scriptures in Joshua chapter 3 today. Um, so we are um, going to see how God goes before us, what it means that God goes before us, and, and kind of the examples that we have of this from scripture in Joshua chapter 3. And as you're getting your Bible out, I also want to encourage you to in your bulletin on the inside, there's a listening guide that has, that has blanks in it to help you follow along today. I want to encourage you to grab that and, a, and grab a pen and follow along in that manner, and you can use that. This goes along with our material that we're using in our Bible study groups or our Sunday school groups, um, so you can come alongside that as well. So uh, I want to encourage you to do that and follow along in your copy of God's Word and, and on this listening guide. So as we uh, prepare to do this, as we, as we look at God's Word together as a church family, as a faith family who says, yeah, we believe in God's Word to be 100% true, 100% from God, inspired by the Spirit of God, and written by the hand of man, and those men who were brought along by the Spirit to record these events. Uh, as we proclaim the truth of God's Word, and therefore proclaiming the truth of God, would we, if you're able, stand together this morning as we read through uh, Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 7. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as far and as for you, command the priests who bear the ark of the covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth, what a phrase, is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priest bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, there it is again, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. What a great testimony of your faithfulness to your word, to your covenants, to your proclamations. God, this is in, in the account of Joshua chapter 3 that we have seen here and in Joshua 4 as we continue on. Would you be with us today, God, as we hear from you, as we see your word in action here and, and see you, the God of all the earth, in action in the life of the Israelites, would you be praised here in the life of this faith family at Russell Chapel, we pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you. Would you be seated, church? The God who goes before, Joshua chapters 3 and 4. So here we set the table. Moses has died. 120 years old, Moses has passed away. We, we previously had before him the death of Aaron, who was the high priest, and now Moses, the, the leader of the Israelites is, is gone, according to Deuteronomy chapter, 30, chapter 34, verse 7. He was 120 years old. His eye had not diminished, nor had his vigor. That is such a testimony in and of itself. The reminder now in Joshua 1.1 is, is this. He says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, and you 
and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. The reminder that we have here, church, is this, that, that God's chosen workers and leaders may pass on, may be united with him in glory, but his work and his mission endures. His mission, his work endures all of mankind and our futility. The mission and great commission of God is not something that is only to be carried out through one particular person, one particular leader, one group, one generation. Because God says, I will raise up new leaders. I will raise up new workers because God doesn't change and His mission doesn't change. The work is not exclusive to the worker, but the one ordaining the work. God speaks directly to Joshua and is now exalting Joshua into the leadership position over the nation of Israel. God's chosen people, God's chosen race of inhabitants of the earth. The same mission, go to the promised land, but a new leader. The same promises being fulfilled, but a new mouthpiece for God. So after the death of Aaron and the death of Moses, both key leaders in the old faction, the old generation, having died, Joshua is now sitting firmly as planted by God in the captain's chair of the nation of Israel. God will speak to Joshua. Joshua will lead this people. The Israelites will will, will once again, here in Joshua, uh, the first two chapters, they're going to send spies into the promised land of of Canaan, specifically to the land of Jericho. This time they'll send two men sent by Joshua as he is now the leader. And and it's it's interesting if we look back into uh, into the account of Israel in the previous generation, they sent out 12 men. How many came back with a good report? Two. Now how many is God sending out? Two. Two. God does cool things. Sends two spies into the land now to say, go and just check out this place called Jericho. Go and check this out. See what it's all about and make sure like what we are getting ourselves into. So they would go out. Their presence uh, would be found out. and, and, And as they're in this place, in this Jericho place, they come in contact with, of all people, a lady named Rahab who was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. These two men of God on a reconnaissance mission for God, for this new generation of Israelites, would come in contact with a prostitute named Rahab who just so happens to be faithful to Yahweh. She's looking for, these men guided here, looking to how do we keep them safe? And she says, hey, while you guys are doing this, remember me and my family. When you guys come in to take over this city, remember me and my family. And these two spies, these two men of Israel, make a pact with Rahab. They say, hey, as, as anyone that's gathered in this place, in this particular house, in this building, uh, you'll be safe. But if you go outside, their blood be on their own hands, Scripture says. But if anything happened to them while they're in this place, the, their blood be on our hands. And that was... That was a way of identifying it. Let, let the guilt of their killing be on us. We've made a pact with you. We've made a, a, a promise. We've made a covenant. They would know because they gave her a red, a red piece of cloth to hang in her window. And guess where her, her window just happened to be located? In the wall of the fortified city. She would let them down to go out into the wilderness to hide from the, the, the internal crew who's going to look for them and and you know what window she let them down the window in the wall of the city so as she releases them into protection and protective custody if you will all on their own they're released outside the camp outside the city they have a head start on what is to come their way 
her faithfulness would provide not only the salvation for herself, but also for her family. Now here we come into Joshua chapter 3. The spies have returned and they've given a report to Joshua. And, and at the end of chapter 2, Joshua sa- or they said to Joshua, excuse me, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. That's a much different story than 40 years ago. New generation comes into play. Truly, God has done this. He has delivered this. Oh, and also, all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So not only has He given us the land, He's given us the people. He's given us the inroads into this land. With this great report and their run-in with Rahab, Joshua is now in the driver's seat, in the, in, the, in, the, in the lead spot over the nation of Israel. And God says, it's time. This land that has been this promised land that you have not yet seen, it's time. Your 40 years are up. The land that flows with Milk and honey be delivered to your hands, nation of Israel. Joshua as the leader, as the captain, as the number one man who speaks to God and speaks for God to the nation of Israel. Forty-year period is over. Aren't you glad? The wandering in the wilderness, in the desert, is about to come to an end. This time of trial is about to be over. And here's how this begins in Joshua chapter 3 now as we look at Israel preparing to cross the Jordan. Then Joshua, verse 1, chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, The officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. There shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Now, a cubit is about a foot and a half, so 3,000 feet difference, over a half half a mile distance between the Ark and the people was to be kept at all times. A thousand yards, ten football fields, one half a mile. God's very specific. He says, do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. You're, you're still in a wandering of sorts because you've never been here. So you have to pay attention to where I want you to go. And then it says in verse Five. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The first thing we see, God has prepared for us a mighty work and we must be ready for it. God's prepared for the Israelites a mighty task ahead of them. Wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Because I said so, is the word of God. Wander in the wilderness for 40 years and be prepared. Be ready for that time when I say go. It's not going to be easy. You will encounter battles. There will be wars waged against you. People will hate you because of me. Be prepared because I have something in store. Something that you've cannot even imagine be prepared for what God is doing and be ready for how he calls us to it he is at work now just as he's been for all of eternity we see him at work here in the in the account of Joshua chapter 3 and 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 all the way back when we flash back to the left in our bibles go all the way back into creation genesis chapter 1 
what was happening. It was God at work. What happened before Genesis chapter 1? God was still doing stuff. He was still at work because He is, he is God and He's eternal and it, and it doesn't stop. And guess what he's doing today? He's at work for his people. He is at work in his people. He goes before us. He goes before us and he says, this is the work that I have for you. I've already been there. Because God's not bound by time. And we can't fathom that. Like, we truly cannot wrap our minds around that because time dictates everything to us. Anybody keep a personal planner or a calendar on your phone that gives you alerts constantly where you're supposed to be? Or you have something that, that, that someone maybe that, that keeps you guided in that direction? Uh, um, time dictates everything for us in our lives, but God's not bound by it. He's been in eternity past, He was at creation, He was active. There he was. He was active here in the account of Israel. He was active in in as we look into the future of Scripture. Here uh, he was active in the in the coming of Christ. He was active in the cross. He was active in the resurrection. He's active today and tomorrow. He's already there. He's already there for when every single one of us that are in Christ to get to glory. He's already there. It's mind-blowing to try to wrap our brains around that. But God is at work. God is doing stuff. And the work that we do for Him now will prepare us for His predetermined eternity. The work we do for Him now Sorry, now should be bolded, underlined, and yellow. The work we do for him now will prepare us for his predetermined return. This does not mean, listen to what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean you work your way to him in eternity. Here's what it means. It means that because of the redeeming work of Christ that he's done in us, we do things now to prepare ourselves and others for eternity. That means we must take his message as we go. This is not supposed to be an episode of Hoarders where we just hang on to all of the grace of God that we can find in our lives and we don't let anyone else in. We do not come to God or work for God closed-fisted. We come to God and we work for God open-handed. God gives, God takes away. We should not grasp onto anything and tell him he cannot have it. The work we do for him now prepares us for his eternity, his glorious eternity, his predetermined eternity. Consecrate yourselves, Joshua says. Consecrate yourselves in verse 5. Here's what consecrate is be set apart, be holy. When? Now. Don't wait for tomorrow. Consecrate yourself. Be set apart now. You're not guaranteed a tomorrow. We don't like to think of that heavy reality. We're not guaranteed a later today. Don't, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do now. Consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart. Be holy now. Why? Because number one, God said so. Be holy because I am holy. It's said, throughout, it's said in Scripture, right? We've got it in Leviticus. We've got it in Peter. Be holy because I'm holy, God says. When? Now. Not later. Be set apart. Go against the flow. Go against the grain. Go against the current of this world. Now. Today. Sunday, July 16th at 1140. Go against the current of this world. Because God said so. What does this world say? Look out for yourself. What does this world say? Hey, store up all your possessions here. Don't worry about what you cannot see. 
Is that setting yourself apart? Or would set yourself apart be, I don't have to have my own way. May God have his. I don't have to have stuff here because there's a treasure waiting on me in glory. Maybe I should work towards that. Consecrate yourselves now. Joshua says, consecrate yourselves in today. For tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders among you. So be holy, be set apart today because God has already gone before you. He's not bound by time. He's already in the tomorrow. So set yourselves apart, be holy. What does this look like? It's also this, that God will use whoever, that should be bold as well, God will use whoever is willing to be used. Age is not a prerequisite. Huh. Only faith. But when, let me ask you this. When, when the kids come up here uh, uh, before the sermon on Sunday mornings, does God look at them and say, I'm not going to use you right now because you're too young? Does God look through our children's ministry and say, there's just nothing that they can be used for right now? Does he look and say, what, what, what a waste of time to pour into them right now because they cannot do anything for me? No. In fact, you know what Jesus says? Let the little children come unto me. Jesus says, you want to come to me? You have the faith of a, oh, not a grown-up, stubborn old fart? Oh, come with the faith of a child? So wait a minute. Age isn't a prerequisite to be used by God. No, He will use the youngest to the oldest. When we're willing to be used, He will use us. Children don't necessarily have that way of saying, God, don't use me today. And that, church, that is what He says to us. You can't come in and say, God, don't use me today. We should come in and say, God, use me every day. Oh, church, that we would have this. Whoever is willing to be used, age not a prerequisite, only faith. As we grow up and grow in the faith and we grow older and we, we learn things that we think are right and wrong, we learn truths of God's Word. Isn't it odd that we get more and more stubborn against being used by God as we learn more about Him? What is it to consecrate yourself then as you, go, as you get older? Don't be stubborn and set out against God. Let God use us. Ask God to use us. Specifically say, God, how can, how can you use me today? Who, Lord, can I encounter today for your glory? Hmm. As you go to the checkout line at Walmart or the pig, Piggly Wiggly, do you say, God, help me. How can I be used right now with this cashier? Should we be saying that? Absolutely. Do we have the faith that it takes to be used by God in that moment? Ooh. We want to say we do, but then when we get there, do we get cold feet? Most of the time. We proclaim this faith that we have to be used by God. To, this faith that we have to say, hey God, I trust you with my eternity future, but I don't trust you in my present. We had a quote this morning in our, in our, in our uh, uh, Bible study groups material that, that said, it was by Corey Ten Boom that said, said you can, uh, I'm going to mess this up and butcher it all to pieces, but hopefully you get the essence. Um, you can trust your future to God. You can trust your, trust your unknown future to a known God. Why can't we trust our known present to a known God? Where's our faith to be used by him where is our faith to say god you are going before me and it's for your glory that you go before me and it's for your glory that you have redeemed me but 
uh, but I don't want to be used by you today. Oh, the heartbreak that that must bring to the Redeemer, to the Creator. Because church, let's be honest, acting in faith will sometimes get messy. Acting in faith will sometimes get messy. In particular, I want to look at this in Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Here's what the Word of God says. And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its, all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood up and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, completely cut off, and people passed over opposite Jericho. What is it? How is that messy? Because the people that were bearing the ark were supposed to go before the people of Israel into the water. As they get into there, if you've ever in your life stepped out into a body of water, it's messy. It's nasty in there. Many rivers and lakes that just have natural bed, not so much with rocks underneath. It's it's grimy, it's slimy. It's the stuff that if we got on us outside of the water, we would be quick to wash off. And these guys walk in holding the Ark of the Covenant, a ginormous wooden box with gold plating on poles. They walk in to this bed on the sea, wet, nasty, slimy, and, and they stand there holding this thing while everyone crosses over. And, it, and it, the Scripture goes on to say that, that all of the people would pass over the Jordan and they would pass over on dry ground. It doesn't say that these guys stood on dry ground. In fact, the original language leads us to believe the exact opposite. Because as, as the, the, the Scripture says, that the, that the bring the priests out of the Jordan. It says that they lifted them out of the Jordan. Like they brought them out. The, the language here leads us to believe that they had sunk in a little bit. They had to get messy so other people could be saved. They had to sink into the mud as the first ones out. They had to be the trailblazers to go out into the nasty and get stuck sometimes. You see, acting in faith will sometimes get really, really messy. The priest had to step out into the water to watch God work. Standing on the shore was not acceptable. Standing on the shore and just watching everything happen was not acceptable for the Levitical priests. God did not command them to stand on the shore and watch everything happen. You know what he says? God's not calling us to comfort, but to our own cross. And it's worth it. God doesn't call us to the comforts of the shore. He calls us to die every day on a cross. I think it was I think it was great for the priests to stand there and hold that thing and to feel themselves sinking just a little bit into that and watching everybody pass over before them. I bet that if we thought about it and had priests that their hearts were in tune with God, they rejoiced to do that. They rejoiced to get messy so that other people might meet the Lord. God's not calling us to comfort, but to our own cross. God is not calling us into comfort, but our own cross. You have there 
uh, in your listening guide, the verse Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And I want to read that for us. Because here's what this word says. And he, Jesus, said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross when daily, and follow me. Three things that Jesus says. If you want to come after Christ, if you want to be in pursuit of Christ as he's been in pursuit of you, three things you must do. The first thing is deny yourself. We have to deny ourselves. What does that mean? It means that we get out of our own way. We get out of God's way. Let God have His way. We have to quit worrying so much about what we want and focus on the heart of God. Deny our Cells. If, it, if something that we want goes contradictory to Scripture and the heart of God, it is not good for us. God will never call you to cheat on your spouse. You called yourself to that. God will never call you to murder someone. You called yourself to that. And that includes hatred that we feel in our hearts towards people. It includes thoughts of lustful adultery. God would never call someone to an abortion because it's murder. God says, I've knit you together in your mother's womb. God was a part of that. He would never say, extinguish the life that I am creating. God would never call you to simply sit back and be comfortable while billions of people in this world are dying and headed to an eternal hell separated from Christ without a knowledge of the name of Jesus, the one who came to save. Deny yourself. Take up His cross daily. Every day when we rise, are we taking our death device with us are we taking our cross are we taking our electric chair our gas chamber are we taking it with us to say you know what it's not me it's nothing in this life is about me as paul said in in philippians to to live is christ and to die is gain he's not calling us unto a life of just extreme and lavish comforts not even worrying about the poor not worrying about those who do not know Christ. It's the exact opposite. He says, people will hate you because of me. You will face intense persecution according to your context. Why? Because of me. Oh, and 400 times in my word, God says, I want you to look out for the poor. And by the way, pure and pure and. An undefiled religion before God our Father is this, that you would care for widows and orphans in their distress. Oh. Really? Yeah. That's denying yourself. That's taking up your cross every day. It's saying to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live here on this earth, I live for Christ and Christ alone. When I die, I have gained more than I could ever gain on this earth because I have gained Christ. That's it. Pick up that cross, church, every single day. We must pick up our cross daily. Deny ourselves and we follow Him. We run. We pursue. We run after Christ with everything that we have including the very breath in our lungs. We run after him because faith gets messy. Jesus never said it would be the cleanest thing that you'll ever do. No, he said people will hate you. You will be killed. You will be persecuted. You will be stoned. Oh, and we'll all be together again. So don't even worry about it. 
because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Faith gets messy. Consecrate yourselves now, today, because God is doing something in the tomorrow. And he wants to use every single one of us in that. You see, the the only plan that God has for taking his redemption story, his redeeming gospel of Jesus Christ to the four corners of the earth and everywhere in between, I know the earth is round, it's a figure of speech, it's us. We're it. You know the plan for discipleship to grow up brothers and sisters in Christ in the faith? Do you know what that plan is? It is the Spirit of God, but you know who the Spirit of God wants to use? Me and you. And the thing is, he could do it all by himself if he wanted to, but he said, no, I want you to be a part of this. Ha! Wow! We get the opportunity to be a part of this. How Stinking exciting is it that we get to play a role in God's redemption plan? Wow. But instead, we carry it as a burden. More than an opportunity. Because faith gets messy. Guess guess what the greatest thing about this? God's not calling us to comfort but to our own cross and it's worth it. There's a greater comfort there. There's a greater comfort in the cross than anything we could ever find here. There is a greater comfort there in the cross of Jesus than we could ever set our thermostats for. There's greater comfort there than we can have padding under our seats. There's greater comfort there than we could ever have most comfortable bed in all the universe. Or having everyone liking us. The comfort there is that God has already gone before us. And he sits there awaiting our arrival. There's so much comfort in the cross that all the comforts of this world look like discomfort there. Faith gets messy. But this in the today is not our end goal. This is not the end game. Our end goal is the nations would know of the glorious Christ who came to redeem and the God that has sent us on that way. And our sister church here in Ekpuitogo has said, we will embrace this. In the face of persecution, we'll embrace it. In people threatening our lives, we'll embrace it. Brothers and sisters throughout India and and China and all over Asia, have stared that persecution down and said there's so much more comfort on that side of the cross than there is on this side of the cross that I don't even care about what's here. The only thing I care about here is that God's gospel message would go from me as I make my way to the other side of that crucifixion of Christ. God is not calling us to our comforts, but to our own cross and it is 100% worth it because true faith, church, will always produce good works. True faith in Christ will always produce good works that are based in Christ. James chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. Sorry, I already said that one. James 2.17, dyslexia kicked in, my bad. 2.17 says this. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What can dead people do? Nothing. Oh, so our faith is dead if we don't have the works that show it? Yeah. If we don't embrace the fact that faith gets messy, and we're not worried more about the other side of life than we are this side of life and making sure that as many people can be there as possible by us telling the gospel story, sharing our testimony, sharing the gospel, sharing the word of God, making disciples of all of the nations. If we don't have something that backs that up, is our faith dead or alive? It's dead. And the only possible way for the dead to be brought back to life is Jesus. 
we read from, again, from the pen of Paul and the inspiration of the Spirit of God in Ephesians chapter 2, that we, every single one of us, are dead in our trespasses. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And that That church is what we embrace to take to the nations. That is what we have that story to share. We have that. And look at what God has also told Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, he says says this, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And it goes on in chapter 4, when they're coming up out of the Jordan, Joshua turns around, grab those 12 stones, grab 12 stones here, stack them here. Why? So that we might be able to tell the story of what God has done for us. We might be able to share God's redemption in our lives. That would be a sign, that would be a signal to someone to ask questions about it. Church, what is your sign or signal that people would ask questions about? I'm not saying we walk around with 12 stones stacked together in our hands all day long, every day. But we should be consecrated. We should go against the flow. So much so that people would say, what is, what is this? And then our faith, knowing that it's going to get messy, we would be able to look at someone and say, This is Jesus. Let me tell you about this. And it's also internally us being okay with that person saying, you are a fruit loop. I don't like you. Maybe someone saying, I want to kill you. Or it may be someone saying, thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you. Because of that, I recognize my sin. I repent of my sin. I place my faith in the hands of Christ that were outstretched for me from as far as the east is from the west. And because of you being obedient to share that gospel story with me, I now have eternal life in Christ. I was dead and now I'm alive. Do we embrace that? Do we embrace that faith? Where is that verse? So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. One more thing on that. By us gathering in here every week in this room together as a faith family, this, while it is a work of faith, is it proclaiming the gospel to anyone? Is it making disciples of our own lives? Are we active in that role to become messy? Pure faith will always drive us right to the heart of worship and discipleship. Joshua 4, 21, 24. We just hit on this. 21, 24. 21 says, And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do those stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord Yahweh, your God, dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. The generation before. Which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that, look at this verse, chapter 24. If you have your Bible, look at this with me. Joshua 4, 24. We proclaim all of this that God has done. We proclaim God's salvation, God's salvific works in our lives, God's everything, His creation, redemption, and all the way through eternity to our glorification and reunion with Him, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Why do we do this? Why do we worship? Why do we even have faith? It's so that all the peoples of the earth would no. Remember back as we looked at how, how Joshua called God. 
called him the God of what? All the earth. So the Lord of all the earth would be known by the people of all the earth. By our works, because of our faith. We should praise him for his goodness in our families. This is our family at home, our family at church. We praise him for his goodness in our families, and we should tell of his goodness to our families. It doesn't just stop and stay within the walls at home. We should praise him for his goodness in our families. We should tell of his goodness to our families and this. We should praise him because all the peoples of the earth should know or would know, and we should ask him to work through us so that all the peoples of the earth would know. Praise Him because He is the God of all the earth and all the people of all the earth will one day know who He is. And it's our job to ask Him how He can use us to make that be the case. Our job that we've been tasked with as a family of believers in Christ, placing our total faith in Christ is this that we would be sure that all the peoples of the earth would know the God of all the earth, the Redeemer in Christ. We need to be in pursuit of Christ as He has been in pursuit of us. What does this mean? Application in our worship, faith is in the driver's seat of worship. It's not emotion. It's not fear, it's not attention. It's being sought to ourselves. Our faith should be the vehicle to lift His name as exalted above all others. Our faith in Him sits in that driver's seat of our worship. Our worship in music, our worship in prayer, our worship in reading His Word, our worship in sharing His Word, our worship in fellowship with one another be driven only by God. There are, I want to throw out a word of caution to you real quick. There are a lot of churches that look like they're doing a lot of good stuff, but what they're driving on is your emotions. They're driving on the emotions of the people. They just want you to feel good. God says, the only thing you need to feel good about is me. That's it. We don't have smoke machines and laser light shows and all that because we're not trying to drive emotion. We're trying to drive faith. Repentance of sin, faith in Christ. We ride that high, not a, not a high of emotion that will crash out. Our fellowship, time spent with God will only increase our faith. Time spent with others in the faith will encourage us to grow. And time spent with people outside the faith then should lead them to Jesus. It at least points them towards Jesus because of us. If time spent with God will only increase our faith, why don't we spend more time with God? Are we afraid of what more faith may bring? Is it, or is it, Easier just to go with the current. Time spent with others in the faith encourage us to grow. This is called discipleship. It's called edification of the body of Christ. And then we should spend time with people outside the faith. So many times we miss that. We should spend time with people outside the faith. Why? Because if we don't, who's coming to faith in Christ? Who's hearing the gospel message? This is our task and our discipleship. If God is going before us to prepare our way in His best interest, what are we doing in the now to show our faith in that God? This is the God that we claim to have faith in. What are we doing now to show that faith to others? Will we spend our time wisely that all the peoples of the earth would know? Are we spending our time foolishly so that nobody sees the God of all the earth in us? Nobody hears about the God of all the earth in, from our lips. 
we have comforts in God, being totally eternal, not bound by time, then what do we have to fear in this world? Faith and fear are water and oil. They don't mix. They cannot mix. They can't be together. God who goes before is this God, this Yahweh, this Jesus that we sang to and that we sang about. That God goes before us. And that God says that all the people of the earth would know I have redeemed you. We have a purpose. We have a plan. And that purpose and plan is to fulfill that commission. God goes before us in those acts. We don't go alone. We don't go into uncharted water. If he calls us to go, he is there before we ever arrive. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come today thanking you, God, for your word, thanking you for this example in Scripture, God, of how we have seen you, the, the promise